Let me uh, start quickly by introducing the topic. We, we have a leadership crisis and sustainability crisis. Sustainability is the topic of this Davos, and you will see a lot of panels addressing the problem of environment and climate change, and uh, generally expressing dissatisfaction with the lack of progress in addressing sustainability issues. And what, what we are going to talk now in the next 25 minutes is about the connection between leadership and education. What can all of us do to address that gap? And how uh, education can uh, project future leaders to address uh, the crisis of sustainability. Let me, let, let's go this way. I will start with Gin Gao. Please, introduce yourself and tell us what do you think about the topic leadership and education. Okay, so to start with, it's important to define what leadership is. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because we are short on time. Um, I'm Gin Gao, so I'm professor at Business Business School. School Lausanne, uh, Toulouse Business School and Paris Business School and I also own, um, have a coaching company on leadership development. So leadership, there is a definition, I pick one from North House, but actually there are so many definitions that it's very difficult to make sense of it. And the basic point that we have to remember is somebody who's going to try to get something done by someone else by influencing that person. Basically, if you start being directive or forcing, you're not doing leadership, okay? That's the main point. Are leaders are born or made? That's a question that comes all the time. And I just want to address this because um, all the research about genes and leadership have not been conclusive so far. So what we can say is basically it's a little bit of genetics and mostly development. Also, the twin studies uh, also shown that it's not necessarily genetic because two twins, identical twins did not develop the same way. Actually, it's a very good news for us to know that leadership is something you develop. It's a good news because the world is changing. A new digital uh, transformation uh, um, it, re reality, like using artificial intelligence, the bitcoins, we talked about it, the cloud computing, where we need the robotics, where we need a lot of creativity and how to work with all these tools. We have um, the social tech changes, the youth. The youth, they want a work that makes sense to them. They want a work that respects the environment, that is value-driven to contribute positively. This is what they want. So they're changing a bit how we perceive work today. They want freedom, they want liberty, they want to be able to work where they want, and they want to contribute and collaborate. And we have the women coming there. We have more and more women taking leadership position, and they bring something, they're adding something to the rational that we need to consider how we move forward, how we develop that, and how we integrate the leadership. We have the international mobility. Look in the crowd here today. We all come from all around the world. How do we work together? Previously, you had the issue about cultural learning to work together. That's the issue today. How do we handle that? It's a major point. And then we have uh, a more diverse workforce, that's why I already mentioned that. We have the SDG requirements, okay? And the, it's true, it comes with a paradox for companies. How do I grow my business uh, without harming the environment and harming, uh, being positive for society? That's the main question. And there are some projects that company cannot do, even if it's good for business, because it's not good for the environment. And we have the economic power shift. We have India growing very fast, we have China growing very fast, we're going to be the future market uh, when the years to come, we have Africa growing very fast, that's also going to be a future market. So all this is changing the requirements. Companies need to come with business models and new leadership styles. So this little bit of business model means you can keep designing strategy the old way, as we used to do, respecting the strategic framework, but once the strategy has been developed, it's important to consider how can we use digital transformation to contribute to the strategy development. And on top of this, how do we integrate the SDG goals in what is developed as a strategy? If I, for example, I de decide to come with a new product, that's a strategy orientation, how do I make sure that this new product, how do I integrate SDG? Do I work on my suppliers? Uh, how do I get my suppliers? What kind of components I want? Do I want components that are going to destroy or not? Do I have something that can replace these components? We need to consider that. So this will be new business, new business models considering these two aspects. 
and of course, new leadership competencies. Because the leadership I was used to do today are not so much relevant for the future. The competences that are coming up, for example, creativity. The fact that we can actually think out of the box, take risk, being imaginative, finding creative solutions, and not always repeat the same old solutions as in the past. The capability of being collaborative, integrating youth people, asking them to give their ideas, not to believe that they have no clue, they have no experience, so they cannot contribute. Get there. Apply different leadership styles. Not one authoritative style that goes top down. Adapt the leadership style to all the people we have. And another important one is technology. Okay. How do we integrate using social media to communicate with other stakeholders? It's an important point. Values. We need to do work that's positively to the environment and to society. I'm not going to make for work on all the competencies. My point is there is a change on leadership competencies, and we need to integrate that in the development. And this can start at a very young age until executive level. Thank you, Guy, for this excellent and positive approach to leadership in competencies. And I think, yes, your institute should be supported. So I invite everybody to talk to Guy later. He wants to fundraise, he wants to create this institute and to do all this amazing stuff he exactly. already is planning. Let's move to Heidi Kupari, the digital economist and founder and executive director of the Dream Tank. I know many think tanks, but this is the only Dream Tank. <laughs> I'm very much curious to know about the Dream Tank. Please, Heidi. Dream Tank is, at its core, a way for kids' dreams to create the future. Because kids' dreams start with unity, empathy, work together, Let's color, let's draw, let's play, we're joyful, we're getting along. And then as they get older, we call dream crushing. Dream crushing happens, right? You can't do that, you're just a kid. You'll never make money doing that. How many people have done that? We all have, right? We've all been dream crushed. Raise yes, your hand yes. if you've been dream crushed at some point in your life. We all are. Okay. And you might have also been a dream crusher, but we teach the kids be compassionate because that person maybe didn't launch their dreams and they're sad and you can help them, right? Or maybe they think they're helping you, right? By giving you that. But what's the key here is that in leadership and education and what we teach, not, I don't like to use the word teach actually, I'm gonna scratch that. What we offer to the children is the idea that and this is starting at age seven. So at age seven, we say to a child, you are amazing and perfect the way you are now. And the way you see the world right now matters now. I don't ever ask a child, what do you want to do when you grow up? I say, what do you want to do now? What are you passionate about? What problem do you want to solve? Be a leader now, we believe in you. So what they get is they get to create something from their dream. We have a process, dream, design, launch. So it's an accelerator program with social impact and the sustainable development goals woven through. And there's a quest-based journey. So how many of you have heard of the hero's journey? A lot of people? The hero's journey is a, like a human journey. It's like Luke Skywalker. Any, anyone who goes through something and they have to take an adventure and take risks to do something different, to do the thing they're meant to do. They need confidence and people around them to actually go do that. So our, our program has a hero's journey type component where they are gonna hit obstacles. We teach them, how are you gonna overcome obstacles? You need mentors. Here's why you need mentors. Yoda, Dumbledore, all, they get that, right? Uh, so having a mentor and being able to launch something in the world from what you're passionate about is incredible. When they're eight years old, they get to see, I can make money doing something I love that makes a positive in, you know, in the world. It doesn't stop there, though, because the think tank, dream tank part of it is, we have companies that propose design challenges to the kids and say, I want to hear, because companies struggle with innovation because 
this, the, and they struggle with retention these days, right? A lot of companies, my background is in finance, um, and uh, I, I noticed that in the corporate world, innovation's a challenge and retention's a challenge. So we're, be, we're doing these ha series of hackathons based on each sustainable development goal. So a company can say, you know what? My company really wants fresh ideas on SDG3 health and well-being. And so uh, an example that we just had, and then I'll conclude, is that a woman named Debbie Sack, who is an advisor of ours, um, she came from New Orleans and she wanted to see what we were doing. She loved the idea when she saw a video that a 14-year-old girl did for our program, her jaw hit the ground. She said, that would have been a billion dollar ad campaign at IBM. I'm sponsoring you to help me have the kids help me develop a game in VR to help veterans. And so then she's going to give equity to the kids. We need a blockchain partner to help with that. Um, but she really, and she invited two kids to be board members. So now these children feel like I have something to say. So that's oh, what bravo. Dream Tank is. Bravo, Heidi. Okay. Wonderful work. Uh -huh. And thank you very much for your excellent presentation and also for everything else you are doing. It really deserves ap uh, applauses. Um, I move to Nindeka Hari, who is a Davos uh, long-timer already. She's a Shoka Fellow and uh, Schwab Foundation Fellow. And her organization is Youth for Technology Foundation. So we are very curious to hear from you, Nindeka. Please, go ahead. Sure, thank you very much, um, everyone. It's certainly a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, this is my fourth time in Davos, but this is the warmest Davos it's ever been, so I'm very thankful for that. Um, the concept of education and leadership is one that is very, very important to me because fundamentally I believe that irrespective of where an individual is born, who their parents are, how much wealth or capital they have access to, fundamentally everyone has talent. The question is, do they have access to the right opportunities? And so 20 years ago, from a cubicle in Redmond, Washington, I was employed at that time by Microsoft, I founded an education technology company called Youth for Technology Foundation. And over the last 20 years, we've introduced appropriate technology to young people and women, mostly in low income and developing countries in the corridors of education and entrepreneurship. Now, many of us know that in developing countries, the educational system is, it's not broken, it's actually obsolete. And it is, in our best interest as we move into the fourth industrial revolution to ensure that our young people have the right skills to compete for 21st century opportunities. And those right skills uh, begin with ensuring that their mentors and their teachers, for instance, have the right skills. So we ask ourselves, what are the right skills? What are the right skills in education? What are the right skills in leadership? And things have moved so fast with the advent of technology, with we're now in the fourth industrial revolution where you know uh, biology is merging with the physical, for instance. And so there are all these technologies that are coming out. And what's happening is that our young people are remaining further and further behind. Our youth are remaining further and further behind. While technology advances bring opportunity, while technology advances bring new jobs and employment opportunities, they also increase the inequality. So there's a concept, I'm, I'm also an Ashoka fellow, and there's a concept in Ashoka that our founder, Bill Drayton, conceived, and this is the rising, what we, we refer to as the rising new inequality where technology, although it's for good in most instances, increases that technology and increases that gap. So, you know, as global citizens, our role is to ensure that our young people are upskilled, our older people are reskilled 
for what we're now going into, which is the 20, which is the fourth industrial revolution. We cannot afford to use 20th century curriculum in the 21st century. We just can't. So these systems are obsolete, and it is our duty as global citizens to try to revamp them as best possible. When we look at the concept of leadership, and you know, two of the prior speakers actually mentioned this, and the concept of, of gender in leadership is one that's also very interesting to me because as a woman, you know, many of you will know, we, we have more MBAs, we have more law degrees, we have more medical degrees, but where we put our heads down in academia, things change in the world of work, right? Very often women in the world of work will, you know, expect someone to come and tap them on their shoulder and, and give them the corner office because we've excelled in academia, but that doesn't happen in the world of work and we wonder why. And that's because in the world of work, there is a critical component that men have in leadership that women historically don't have. Who can tell me what that characteristic is? A wild guess, thrown out to the audience. There's a characteristic that men have, research from Columbia, research from University of Michigan, has demonstrated over the years that men have this specific characteristic. I'm sorry? Confidence. 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 Thank you so much. And what we know is that in the world of work, in leadership, confidence matters just as much as competence. And while our male counterparts are asking for pay increases four times as much and asking for one third as much as women do, we don't do that. And so it is necessary as we look into leadership and, and diversity and inclusion, both in the education and in the entrepreneurship se sector to make sure that women are well positioned to succeed in this space. Okay, thank you very much, Nideka. Uh, very briefly. Yeah, I, br I briefly want to add something to what she just explained. Uh, I'm creating an organization called the Swiss Institute uh, for Leadership, for the Leadership for Developing t uh, the Modern World. And the, uh, the objective will be to advance the idea of leadership, the knowledge of leadership, and with a strong focus on women leadership, because the confidence that men have come often be because of past experience being there, and uh, always been there, and the women have to find this position and find a way to make it. And the other point of focus will be to f develop leadership in developing countries, uh, because opportunities are going to come there, and they also, because of technology uh, shortage, they need to come up to speed. So that would be the focus point of the Institute of Leadership uh, from Switzerland. Absolutely. It's, it's interesting. We met only an hour ago. N none of us knew each other before that, but I see so much synergy already creating in this group. Now let me move to Siraj Kumar, who is the founding uh, vice chancellor of the most successful private university in India, only 10 years old university, Jindal Global University. Raj will tell us about this success story. Thank you so much. Um, well, thank you Caspian uh, Week for inviting us here. Uh, I think the theme of education and leadership is probably one of the most uh, significant challenges that we need to address because education obviously connects with almost everybody in the world and it also a huge empowering dimension for the future. Uh, one of the big challenges with regard to education is that the dramatic changes that education is going through, including the challenge that is posed uh, due to technology. People talked about uh, online learning, also MOOCs and other types of technological platforms, are, including artificial intelligence, robotics. I am uh, at least uh, you know, convinced that despite all these technological innovations that have come uh, before us, the heart of education will not change, and rather it should not change. It is social transformation, it is about leadership, it is about responsibility, it is also about you know, impacting uh, society through leadership. And that's where one of the biggest dilemmas of education comes forward because uh, the, the, the natural tendency for most of our universities is to go in the direction of the new technologies that are coming through and embracing them, but not to fully recognize that the study of humanities and social sciences are going to define as to the ki kind of choices that we are going to make as people. And to help us make those choices, it is important for us to have enlightened leadership. Today, we are also increasingly moving into a world where 
violence of all forms and manifestation including conflicts are at times even celebrated we are also increasingly moving into a world where the kind of uh, you know information that is out there put in public domain be it in the form of fake news or other ways by which public discourse is manipulated we have so little control over it even the biggest corporations and companies and business enterprises i dare say some of which are present here in davos are also engaged in that in that context it's important for us to develop leadership that can also challenge the existing framework and also develop a new imagination a new imagination in which the institutions the universities and enlightened leadership in those universities are able to assume a challenge we in india have approximately over 1.3 billion people uh, indian life expectancy has increased to over 71 we have 850 million people in india who are less than 35 years of age when most parts of the western world will become older when most parts of eastern world including china and japan will become older india will be younger and will be younger for a longer time i say this because these young people in india are going to shape the future of india but also the future of the world and that is why it is important for us to build an educational imagination that will not only equip them with the knowledge and skills but that can also promote a deeper sense of social change and recognizing that education can seek fundamental social transformation but most importantly it can also help them make the right choices that can benefit their society but also the world at large so leadership and education is all about it's also about social transformation but also impacting the lives of others thank you thank you raj i think your message should go to all panels across the uh, street down to uh, everybody to hear the importance of leadership and importance of changing this uh, perceptions and imagination indeed you you are speaking tomorrow again and please pass this message to all others uh in davos uh, and uh, carry this message and also the, the 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 number you mentioned the 800 million young people in india the demand for education and leadership is really amazing and jindal has been such a champion in uh, offering such a model now let's move to Christina, another amazing speaker, founder and CEO of Purpose Entertainment. So please, Christina, tell us your perspective on leadership. Thank you. I'm Christina Corp. I am from. Uh, I live in Florida, in the USA. Um, as you can see, I'm, I look a little different than everybody else because I come from the uh, entertainment world. I was a singer for a long time. Came from a family of artists. I fell into uh, the space world. I ran a media company, a record label, a production company, and a radio show. And I have a quiet, boring life. I decided to work for an astronaut. And I did not know what I was getting myself into. So for 10 years, I managed Buzz Aldrin, Apollo 11 moonwalker. It was not something that I had planned for my life, but it clearly has made a big impact on me. Um, I became the witness around the world, hearing every single day what the first moon landing meant to the world. And I think that's one thing that I don't hear a lot of people talk about in education too, is the inspiration. Um, I had a big meeting with Boeing and Lockheed last month, and they all complained that they do not have the next generation workforce. And I'm saying to them, you need to inspire people. You need to make them want to be a part of it. You need to make them excited to be engineers and scientists and to have creative thinking within all of this. And so if you think about all the game changers of the world, the people who are making a huge difference, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, the Google guys, um, Richard Branson, every single one of them will tell you that it was the apollo moon landings that changed their life jeff bezos gave me a tour of his blue origin uh, rocket company and he was telling me about some pistons and i said are you just learning this as you go along he said no i was five years old and i watched the moon landing and that changed my life and that made me think i have got to figure out a way i may not get to go to space but maybe i can figure out a way 
to do something that changes the world. The richest man in the world. Well, maybe not right now, but he's close. And I was with him on the day he first became richest man in the world with all the Apollo astronauts, and they were all shaking his hand. The point is, these guys were inspired by something really amazing and something that united us as humans. If you think about the moon landings, it's the one, re one time in recorded human history where the world stopped, waited in anticipation, and then celebrated a human achievement. And that changed the world. That has changed our whole technology, everything that we do. I have a lot of people who say to me, why should I care about space? Space has nothing to do with my life. And I say, do you have a cell phone? There's communication satellites in orbits. How do you think they get up there? Rockets. And so there are a lot of people who've gone into NASA because of the inspiration. What we have done in the Aldrin world, uh, Buzz Aldrin said to me, because he's been planning Mars missions for 30 years, and he says, how are we going to carry this on? And I said, through the kids. Do the kids. The kids all learn about Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walking on the moon. So if you start to lay the groundwork to get kids to think about the future and the way that they can be a part of it, that is the way to carry on the legacy and hopefully keep them inspired. If you think about kids, kids and space is magic. We all love the moon and the stars. That's where our dreams kind of come from before we smash and stomp our dreams. So if you cultivate that, if you start to make kids think, wow, I could be a part of the future. I'm telling you right now, space is the future. China has a 20-year commitment to not only get on the moon, they've got the political will and the money. Uh, Dubai, Dubai is planning to have a Mars city in 100 years. The, the people who are making a big difference are investing in space. So, regarding the SDGs, really quickly, there's an opportunity here that I really want people to think about. When you can learn how to live in space, you have to be able to grow food with no water. You have to learn to recycle water. You need to have purify the air. You need to solve radiation issues. You're doing solar panels and clean energy. You take all of that and you figure out how to make it help the planet, it's, it's all right there. Some people have to figure out how to take that. And that's what in the Aldrin Family Foundation, which I helped start, the idea is to educate kids from K through 12 to help cultivate the next generation of game changers, the ones who are going to change the, the world. They're going to go along with the education, the, the technology. It's, it's the reality. Every kid knows how to use an iPhone or a, you know, a touch screen. But if you can still somehow figure out how to inspire them when they're very, very young, that's how you keep it going. You've got to get them to care about being something part of bigger and greater than themselves. So. If you go to aldrinfoundation.org, that's, that's the programs that we do there. So pr through Purpose Entertainment, I'm trying to inspire now, inspire kids through big activations. So, Excellent, thank you. amazing. Children, space, sustainability, education. I just want to add that the word inspiration is so central to education because most of what universities and education institutions ought to be doing is to develop and fire their imagination for young people so that they can go on and achieve greater things. You mentioned about the Mars mission. In fact, the distinction between, we are here at the Caspian Regions Academy, the distinction between the developed countries and the developing countries is shrinking. The aspiration to undertake these missions are no longer confined to developed countries. I want to report to you, which I'm sure you're aware, that India had a successful mission to Mars and let me tell you, the cost of the Indian successful Mars mission was less than the cost of the movie Gravity by Hollywood. So the cost of what uh, Hollywood movie Gravity, the money that was spent, that amount was much significant, much more than what India spent on a successful mission to Mars. And so frugal innovation is another significant area which developing countries ought to invest. And, and it was a small inspired team. Yeah, it, it was a very small Indian absolutely, team. Absolutely. And I don't know if you know this, but Israel also, a very small team, got a rover to the moon, which costs like a fraction of what, you know, major nations. So there's an opportunity there, you know, outside of it. <laughs> Things can be done really amazing, yes. Just, the, uh, just oh, yeah. so fun how this is all coming together. Um, this past summer, we did a Future Cities Accelerator 
apply to Boulder. And in order to come up with ideas on how they might solve problems on Earth, we did a space settlement design challenge. And we brought them, we, we set up a dome. First, we brought them to NOAA, which is in, which is in uh, Boulder. And they got to see on a map, what does the world look like if we don't change the temperature? And they could see it getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And what happens if we don't? So they got this real this data set of reality of information and then we set up a dome and we said okay now your role is to create a sustainable system where the sustainable development goals are achieved within a closed loop you know habitat space habitat and wow that was an exciting experience and now we're going to end up doing a two-day Dream Space Hackathon in Colorado Springs at the end of March to really bring some of those ideas to the global leaders working on space. Thank you. Now let's move to Alan Belizer, who is the CEO and the founder of Swiss Premium Education. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. It's true that uh, I've been working in the, in the education field in Switzerland and I'd like to share a little bit about what is happening here because I think it's very innovative and uh, we are bringing leadership inside the schools. Uh, I had the chance to work at different levels of education, whether it's summer camps, higher education and also executive education. And what we see actually across most of the institutions that are in Switzerland is that they try to bring this leadership and bring the changes already in the classrooms by flipping over the classroom, by talking to the Generation Z in the way they need to hear it. It's uh, the, as, as my colleague said, I think that the way, uh, the former way of teaching is over, and we need to bring now a new, a transformative way of, of teaching to, to to the audience. And uh, children need to be involved in new projects. They need to do group work uh, and create new new solutions for for the world. To today and uh, they bring also a lot of uh, uh, external guests they do partnerships with companies uh, to, to show what, what is happening today in the world I think uh, we're talking about the issues about women in the world I think that is something that is recurrent in all the schools in all the programs they really try to show examples and break those former barriers that that we, we had uh, in terms of leadership I want to say it's happening inside the school but it's also also happening outside the schools uh, most of the higher education uh, institution and executive uh, education institutions are now also making collaboration with companies, with government, with foreign institutions, universities to exchange best, best practices. Uh, we've done a lot of research in Switzerland about uh, uh, innovation, about transformation, about sustainability, and we try to exchange those, those knowledge with universities by having teachers coming here and teachers going also abroad uh, sharing these, these experiences. And now more and more uh, farm trips are also being organized with government with institutions to come and visit and try to understand what is happening here in Switzerland. So as a conclusion, because I know we are pressed with time, <laughs> I want to say that it's really the responsibility of every institution to bring this change within the school and make a difference for the students. Thank you. Amazing panel, amazing ideas. Thank you, everyone.